Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, before we begin, I would like to say that this project is a continuation of a close reading essay that I did in college in my Harry Potter class. A close reading essay is where we take short passages and analyze specific words. These passages are not usually paragraphs, they're supposed to be sentences. So a lot of my analysis is based not only on quotes from the text, from characters, from the narrative, but those words specifically. Um, and you'll see those in the PowerPoint. I'd like to review several key terms. First, a word of warning. This is um, an essay that references bullying, manipulation, death and violence, and identity issues that are prevalent throughout the Harry Potter series. But if any time you are uncomfortable, please feel free to leave. Queer theory is actually a theory promoted by Nikki Sullivan, who used the works of Judith Butler, among others. If you saw Patrick's talk, he talked a lot about this. Um, in his postmodern concepts. Queer theory is a study of the essential self with respect to feminist and queer identities, emphasizing the social construction of sexuality and gender. And to other someone is to conceptualize a person as excluded and intrinsically different from oneself. Internalized homophobia is when a queer person resents their own desires, identity, and social group, often attempting to pass as heterosexual or denying their sexuality altogether, which in turn causes behavioral issues and low self-esteem. I think we can all see that in Draco Malfoy. Look how sad he is. <laughs> sad. Okay. <laughs> Social indoctrination is forcible, coercive attempts to make people act and think on the basis of, of a certain ideology. Death Eaters, Voldemort, obviously th prevalent throughout the series. And hypermasculinity is an exaggeration of male stereotypical behavior, such as extreme physical strength, aggression, and heterosexuality. I don't think Draco performs um, aggression in the same way. That's why he keeps Crabbe and Goyle with him, kind of like his bodyguards. But he does exhibit some traits of hyper heterosexuality with the way he interacts with pansy um, and it's interesting to me that he's unable to perform in this way despite it being a logical way for him to survive within his environment because if he were a manly man and more confident in himself he might not be as fall as victim to Voldemort as he does and his father does the hero's enemy and a school-wide bully, Draco Malfoy is the character that author J.K. Rowling's readers love to hate. But what if he is more victim than villain? Harry Potter is not the sole boy in Hogwarts who feels overwhelmed. Harry uses the dark arts only when he loses control, whereas Draco attempts to align himself with the dark arts in order to gain control over his situation. This essay's title references Draco's absolute panic when he encounters creatures from the Forbidden Forest, Thestrals, which prefer the dark, and this fear was inverted during his sixth year to the point of causing him inordinate physical and emotional turmoil. In this essay, I will use the concept of queer theory to demonstrate how Draco Malfoy's story is one of repression, specifically how his role within the books represents internalized homophobia and social indoctrination. Rowling's own thoughts on the inclusion of gay characters in the series can also help us understand this allegorical use of Draco, his personality, the abuse he endures from Voldemort, and its ensuing long-term consequences, the pressure to continue the pure blood line, and a symbol of the vanishing cabinet, as well as his draw to dark magic, all point to a misunderstood boy who was forced, rather than decided, to make all the wrong choices. Now, however loath I am to prove homosexuality through stereotypes, Draco's behavior in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince certainly suggests a queer reading. On the Hogwarts Express, Draco brags about his role in Voldemort's ranks while lounging in Pansy Parkinson's lap, the archetypal model of a gay man hiding his sexuality by exaggerating his masculinity and publicly demonstrating his straightness. He also spends a lot of time in his sixth year outside of his time with the cabinet confiding in the ghost moaning Myrtle. His closest friendship is with this 11-year-old ghost who adores him, reflecting the trope of a female character with a gay best friend. In chapter 21, when asked about her visitor, Myrtle tells Harry and Ron, I mean, he's sensitive, people bully him too, and he feels lonely and hasn't got anybody to talk to, and he's not afraid to show his feelings and cry. This is significant when considered in parallel to Hermione's experience in the Sorcerer's Stone, because the only other character in the series seen sobbing in the bathroom is a young girl who feels ostracized from her peers, therefore branding this particular type of breakdown as feminine. 
Rowling never describes Harry and Ron, her leading men, as sensitive, defined as possessing delicate or tender feelings, and their tears are solely reserved for tragedies like death or anger that leads to the masculine-coded act of revenge. Conversely, Draco is often called weak and cowardly, traits attributed to queer characters to relegate them to the ridiculed villains and punchlines across media platforms. When added to his experiences with the closet-like vanishing cabinet, it makes for a distinctive and intriguing analysis. In chapters 14 and 15 of The Half-Blood Prince, Draco's ailment is made apparent to both Harry and the reader, although the extent of it is not known until it's far too late for Draco to escape. Both instances point to Draco's rapid departure from activities he normally enjoys, such as sports and his favorite class. When Malfoy misses a Quidditch match, Harry is enraged and suspicious, asking, he's ill? What's wrong with him? Later during potions, Harry notices that Malfoy did, after all, look a little ill. He had dark shadows under his eyes and a distinctly grayish tinge to his skin. The repetition of the word ill is particularly remarkable because it highlights the severity of Malfoy's condition in its emphasis. Modernly, we understand this as a synonym to sick, as both words refer to an unsound or disordered bodily condition. We also know homosexuality was once considered a type of mental illness that could be cured. Most interestingly, though, the obsolete Scottish definition traces ill to someone who is morally evil, wicked, and blameworthy. Draco Malfoy is often categorized as evil, and the connotation of wickedness when referring to witches and wizards cannot be missed. The blame, however, for his condition, as well as the eventual malevolence he allows into his beloved school, cannot be placed on Draco himself, but rather external forces he could not control. Draco Malfoy's reliance on the vanishing cabinet, coupled with his obsessive need to complete a dangerous mission designed to either damage or kill him, represents his withdrawal into the closet as well as a retreat into self-loathing. He spends most of his time in the Half-Blood Prince, closed up in the Room of Requirement, confined to a windowless room and a thankless task. I had to mend the broken vanishing cabinet, he tells Dumbledore in chapter 27. He arrives at this idea on his own, demonstrating the lengths which he goes to to please his abusers, and actively seeks to repair it at the cost of his own well-being, demonstrating the internalized hatred of his own inferior identity that leads him to believe this immoral act is his only choice in life. Two words specifically stand out to me in that quote, had and vanishing. Had here is selected specifically because Draco betraying himself in his school is a duty, obligation, or requirement created by Voldemort to test Draco as well as punish the Malfoys for their failures. Additionally, Draco is vanishing a part of himself to adhere to the standards placed upon him by Lucius Malfoy and Voldemort. To vanish means to disappear by decaying, coming to an end, or ceasing to exist. Draco's livelihood disappeared with each failure to fix the cabinet. Undoubtedly, Draco's physical and mental states decayed during his sixth year because of his diminishing hope that he could ever succeed. Eventually, his time at school came to an end due to his victory with the cabinet, and his individuality ceased to exist when he was indoctrinated into a clan of magical purists. In a dramatic depiction of the last moments of Albus Dumbledore, which is also in chapter 27, Draco reveals that he is suffering to much the same extent as his weakened headmaster. Although Rowling never spoke directly about Draco's sexuality, Dumbledore's orientation was clearly defined as homosexual, and his romantic love for Grindelwald was elucidated in the Fantastic Beasts films. I view this as a blatant connection between Draco and Dumbledore, an association that Dumbledore himself might sense as the Slytherin boy hesitates to murder the great wizard. He offers to help Draco flee to protect the Malfoy family, potentially leading Draco from the darkness toward a better life. But Draco refuses assistance, saying, he told me to do it or he'll kill me. I've got no choice. Draco has been forced into his metaphorical closet for so long that he considers hiding his true self the only option besides death. He's isolated, even repudiating powerful allies. This is common for many young gay men who face prejudice or violence in society due to their identity. Rowling has constructed that reality for Draco. He can either be persecuted as other or accept the Death Eater's bigoted ways as his own. Draco Malfoy has obviously already inherited some of these biases, and I cannot claim his innocence, although I will argue that, like all prejudices, Draco's awful ideas about bloodlines were inherited, ingrained, and socially constructed. 
His father taught him disdain for Mongol-born students, and he is comfortable with his upper-class pureblood status as well as his white male privilege. According to the Wizarding World website Pottermore, Draco Malfoy uses the slur mud blood 17 times and makes 170 nasty comments. That's an actual quote from Pottermore. It's a nasty comment. <laughs> throughout all seven books, though that barely conveys the extent of his harassment. This is striking when compared to Dumbledore's words spoken to Harry in chapter 23 of The Half-Blood Prince, where he reflects, in spite of all the temptation you have endured, all the suffering, you remain pure of heart. So Draco may be magically pure or unmixed and unadulterated, but his upbringing and learned othering shaped him into someone malicious and therefore impure of heart. However, the bully is often bullied, as referenced in Myrtle's quote earlier, and a common presentation of gay characters in media is the arrogant aggressor who uses his power over others to mask his own dis insecurities and discomfort. Furthermore, Draco has been under pressure his entire life to marry a woman and continue the pure Malfoy line like his father Lucius Malfoy did when marrying Narcissa Black. Any homosexual inclinations were in direct opposition to that expectation. I return to chapters 27 once more then to demonstrate that Draco deserves pity rather than animosity and that the boy's entire character can be summarized by the quote, I haven't got any options. He actually has not made a single choice for himself since the first book. It's a running joke in the series that a majority of Draco's phrases begin with, my father, but what does that illustrate about the influence Lucius had over his son? The Pottermore site reminds readers that Draco is happy to be sorted into Slytherin House because that's where the bad wizards go, and that's where his father wanted him. But his connections to Lucius, the Death Eaters, and Voldemort all lead him to spending the entirety of the Half-Blood Prince totally terrified and unraveling at the seams. He's afraid to make any move that could make Voldemort question his loyalty or jeopardize his family's safety. In Deathly Hallows, that will change, and he will be given, and he will take many offers of redemption. But his fate was depressingly finite in Book 6. So was Draco Malfoy the bad to Harry Potter's good, one of the many villains to the boy who lives hero? The answer is hardly simple. Draco behaves in a shockingly deplorable manner towards Hermione, and he is overall a cruel, spiteful, and selfish person. However, Draco truly redeems himself in the end. He does not identify Harry to his family when the deed would have brought favor back to the Malfoys. Instead, he remains silent, saving a boy who consistently refers to him as his enemy from Voldemort. Twice he willingly sacrifices a wand to Harry. Twice. Despite somewhat participating in the Battle of Hogwarts on the villainous side, he eventually switches over and the Malfoys remain in the Great Hall during the aftermath. Only if you've read the books, because the movies really mess that up. <laughs> all of this is stunning character growth, yet the books never let Draco break free of all his childhood restraints. He marries Astoria Greengrass, a fellow pure-blood Slytherin, and their son Scorpius is sorted into their old Hogwarts house. Unfortunately, gay, marry, gay men do marry women and start families if they are still closeted. I do not believe Draco ever fully accepted himself or forgave himself for the things he did and the person he was in his youth, and I doubt he ever will.